right now I'm studying at CMI and uh, also I really like math. So I think that's <laughs> that's a good intro. Uh, yeah. Right, so today's talk will be about invariance and monovariance. Uh, so before we start, um, I should probably give a fair warning that a fair bit of the problems and the theory that shows up here is written in like full uh, like expansion in Arthur Engel. So problem solving strategies by Arthur Engel. It's a very popular book among uh, Olympiad aspirants. And so you, just stop. So you may have um, heard of this, heard of some of the problems here or you know done them yourself. Uh, but I still sincerely hope that you take away something from this lecture, even if you've done the book. And if you've not done the book, you don't know about then that's even better. Uh, right. So I think uh, this is as good a place as any to start on the invariance principle. Also, I won't be reading the chat because you know I'm on the, on a different tab. So if you have any questions at any point, uh, please do open your mic and uh, you can tell me your issues and we can talk about them. Right. Uh, right. So the invariance principle is not, is only like a theorem or a principle in the sense that it is it's like a commentary. So that there's a process and now I want to observe what happens to this process. And invariance principle is just a tool that helps us study it. That's pretty much all there is to it that makes it a principle or a theorem, so as to speak. Uh, because it's in it's it's very fundamental, it's very simple. And for those of you I've been sharing this tab for like a while, and for those of you who've been here for some time, you probably read it, but I'll still say it out loud. Right. So what the invariance principle says is basically that if you start off in a state, your state could be anything. It's it's an object with certain properties, and that's it. That's your state. And the, then the properties could be whatever you want. You start off with the state, and you apply your transformation to that state repeatedly. And so every time you apply a transformation, your state changes. Maybe your object stays the same, but the properties that define your state will change over time. And your job, well, you know, it's just speculation that you want to find out what happens to uh, your object over time. What the invariance principle says is that every time you make a change, you want to look at what stays fixed. So you want to look at properties of the object that are indifferent to your change, that don't care about your change, they're still, they'll just stay the same. And why is this a good idea? Is because if you want to study the future states of, you know, your object, then these invariant properties, since you know they're invariant by definition, they stay the same, right? They don't change. And hence, if something was true, or if something or if a certain property held, or if a certain uh, function had a certain value uh, in the beginning, in this inner starting state, and that function or property is invariant, then that's then that will still continue to hold in all of your future states. Now that's really vague, and it's you if you just this is the first time you're hearing of it, you'll be like, this is not so much a principle, this is just general life advice. And why is and that's true. In in a way, it is just life advice. Which is why we also say that the invariance principle is what we call a heuristic principle. In the sense that you the only good way you can learn it is through problems. There is really no internal theory to it. The only theory is the lessons you learn from the problems. So I think this is as good a place as any to just get into the problems right away. Mainly because there is really no theory to cover. So yeah, I'll actually start the problems. The thing is, I can't use my laptop. I have to use my tab. So just bear with me for one minute. I'll switch to my tab and then we can start writing there. I'll do the solutions. And for uh, I hope that all of you have the PDF on access to so at any point of time you want to check back on the problems that are being done. You can always do that. Sorry. <laughs> Right, uh, I'll switch to my, switch to my, uh, by the way, if any, any of you have any questions, please feel free to, all right, thank you, thank you, um, thank you for sharing, uh, yeah, so for those of you who didn't have the PDF, it's in the chat now, you can open it and see, and maybe keep it in the background. Okay, I'll just give me two minutes and I'll switch to my tab.
Uh, right, so I think I've joined in through my tablet. Let me just share my screen. Uh, right. Okay. So, okay, let's take a look at the first problem. So, I think this is 1.1. 1. 1.1 1. 1 says that I start off with numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 2n, where 2n is, where n is odd. So, keep in mind that n is odd. Also, this is just a general apology from my side that I don't have a pen tablet, so I'm just using my tablet because it's a large screen I can actually use my finger on. So the handwriting will be exactly how I would expect someone writing with a finger. It won't be super exquisite or anything. It's, it's yeah, so I'm sorry for that in advance. Right. So, yeah, so we start off writing these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 2, and where n is all on a blackboard or on paper, whatever. And we apply this transformation, right? So we take A and B, which are two arbitrary numbers in our list. Thanks, Rohan. Which are two arbitrary numbers in our list. And then we replace them by the difference. Now we write the difference as mod A minus B. Why? Because, well, usually when you say difference, so you, you think of numbers like 5 and 3, and you say the difference is just 5 minus 3. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Bishop. 5 minus 3 is 2. And it said, well, you could just write A minus B. Why is the difference? Why do you need a mod? The thing is, I don't really know which one of A and B is better. I just know that, you know, the difference is, well, the difference. So we have really no way to know which one is larger. So I can't write, uh, I can't just uh, write A minus B because what if A minus B is negative, right? So we need a, so say you have five, three, five instead of five, three, and three minus five would be minus two. And that would be a problem. We don't want negative numbers in our, in our situations, which is why we write mod A minus B. Uh, I need to justify this. I just want you guys to have a good picture in your head. So yeah, that's what this is. I take A and B and I replace them by the difference. So uh, on a short scale, what this looks like is you have one, two, three, four. Uh, actually, this is a bad idea because four by two. So if this is, if I treat four as two and then N would be two and that would violate uh, N is odd. So yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then I take any two arbitrary numbers. So say I take two and five, and I replace them by the difference. So three. And now that this is a, we are replacing it. So we don't keep the original numbers. We just replace them by the difference. So our list, what was initially there, now becomes one, three, three, four, six. Also, the order doesn't matter. Like we're just picking elements at random. We don't need any adjacency condition. So we don't really need to worry about the order. So this is the process. And you can, and then again, you can take two arbitrary numbers of your choice and then replace them by the difference. Uh, right. So this is the process. So this is, I'll, so right. Okay, I'll just drop this off. Uh, okay. Right. This is my process. And now it's asking, now it's, uh, now the question says that show that The ending number or the number that's left last since so you can see that uh, the, the the set of numbers on the blackboard or the paper you start off with keeps falling because we start we take two numbers and then we replace it by a single number so if you start off with two n numbers initially it will fall to two n minus one and two n minus two eventually you'll be left with just a single number so the question says is that show that the ending number is always odd ending number is always odd this is what the question asks so i'll just uh do my nice boundary over here and i'll zoom out so that right uh i don't think i should keep rambling on i'll just give you guys uh let's say two minutes to come up with something and i don't expect you to say anything meaningful because for, for those of you who know the 
for this is a really popular question among people who know invariance. So either you know it, yes, sure, yeah, you will get one. <laughs> okay, so two minutes, ten seconds. Then. Okay. So yeah, right. So uh, two minutes, ten seconds, and come up with anything you have, like any ideas whatsoever. Just we want to be as natural to the problem-solving approach as possible because I don't want you guys to go away with like ten new solutions to problems and just no new ideas. I want. I want that when you are done with this talk, you have some new ideas that you can apply liberally to any problem you see. So just take uh, ten seconds of pause. So just take two minutes and give me any ideas you have about this problem or like how you would approach it. Uh, I I think right now I can see the chats, but <laughs> please please use your mic because well a that will make the discussion more lively. Also, if I'm not looking at the chats by mistake, uh, then that would be kind of sad. Right. So Aditya is saying that make cases for a being odd and b being even. Yeah, that is that's a good idea. That is definitely an idea. And uh, okay, I'll, I'll come. I'll circle back to it then. Part is how he saying says that sum of one plus two plus Okay, that's. I mean, that's obviously an idea. And <laughs> this is kind of scaring me that you guys, too many of you already uh, know the solution here. But okay, why partial sorting? Why do you want to sum up all the numbers? I'm not, okay. I'm just like asking for like a honest solution, like a solution that if you haven't seen this problem before, you see it on a contest, and now you want to think of things. So why would you think of summing up everything? You can open your mic uh, if you want to. Okay, a uh, why? Okay, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go on, go on. Part is helpful. You were saying something, I think. Okay, I think you're typing. Okay. Right. Also, the only reason I didn't ask Aditya uh, why he chose to make cases is because I think when anyone sees this problem, they really want to. In general, this is I think the, the general approach to Olympiad math. You see a problem, you bash out all the cases you want to work with, and you see where it leads you. Yeah. So since we are only dealing with odd and even, it's probably a good idea. No, I mean that's what I do, Rohan. Unless there's like a clear solution path. Well, Sorry, I can give the answer Sankar. for the part of Sarthi then, uh, because I'm, I don't think he's... No, no, Sankar, uh, I don't want an answer. I just want like a... If you, I don't yeah, know yeah. if you've seen this problem before, but... Oh, I have mean, you just... Do you see this problem for the first time you figured it out? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, okay, then please go on. Uh, yeah, so... I mean, because we're like doing invariance kind of thing, so you can notice that the <laughs> uh, parity of the uh, sum is invariant. I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, you just... apply the invariant principle, and you notice that that's not not Absolutely. changing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a perfect solution. Uh, you notice that the sum is an invariant, and okay, fine, fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little disappointed because the solution got spoiled immediately, because I had planned like a whole thing here, because. Okay, but I think about, even I, if people haven't seen Engel, this uh, problem is. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying you so, have. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that uh, yeah, the yeah. discussion ended a little more quickly than oh, Okay, it has not ended. I'm just saying. Uh, good, very good. So some good solution is perfect. It's also the like the most well-known solution of this question. I want to expand. Okay, so I think uh, Parthasarthi 
I think this is what you had in mind, right? Because uh, Sankar says that he's never seen the and I trust him. Okay, I completely trust him. He's never seen the ground before. And uh, yeah, maybe you. This is probably. No, no. I said I have seen. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Then why did you spoil yeah. Sankar? Uh, okay, whatever. I thought. No, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, just, yeah. uh, this is just general advice. Like you've seen the problem, stay quiet. And uh, I mean, okay, please, <laughs> if you have. Okay, sorry. Too good. Right. Uh, okay, so since Sankar knew the problem, we'll pretend that the problem hasn't been solved yet. Patasarthi, did you also know the problem, and like, uh, were you just going to tell us how it works? Okay, yeah, you knew. Okay, fine, fine. Anyone who has so right, since people we have already kind of gotten to know that people know this problem. Uh, anyone who hasn't seen this problem before, do you have any ideas? Anyone? Also, I think uh, I've given way more time than I intended to. I'll... We can try. Con- uh, we can try considering the uh, uh, parity of the uh, some of the elements, and then we can try to prove that uh, it would be all resolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically what Sankal said and what Parthasarthi said. And I, right now, I think what even Aditya is saying. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was not listening to that actually. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Have you seen this problem before? Um, no. Oh wow, good for you, Isra. That's really smart of you. Uh, right. Okay, okay. So for those of you who and okay, I'll I'll be honest. I did not think of taking the sum right away. My approach was what Aditya initially said, is that I'll dash out and see what happens. Uh, right. I'll actually. I think now is probably a good time I get to a solution. Uh, right. So just give me a second. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. So actually, because odd and even are like very English words and they take space and time to write, I'll go ahead and write odd as one and even as zero. For those of you who've seen like some, yeah, Akshay is right. Bashing out is nice. In this case, it's. I mean, I I am stupid. That's why I bash things out. But for smart people, bashing is not a good uh, idea. So, but yes, in this case, bashing kind of works out. Right. I'll get back to where I was. So I'll write odd as one and even as zero because I'm lazy and also I I have a time limit and I want to finish it that time. Right. So I look at odd and even and I'll see because so why is the like why is sorry. Oh, okay. Is okay. Too much. Why is looking? Why is taking cases good? Because I want to see what happens if A and B were odd. What is the difference? What is the parity of the difference? Oh right, I haven't defined parity. I'll quickly define parity. Parity is the state of being. Sorry for the poor handwriting. Even or odd, and this is a little vague. I'll nicely give an example. So, if someone asks me what is the parity of five, I'll say the parity of five is you know odd or one. If someone asks me what is the parity of sixteen, I'll say it's even or you know zero. That's what the parity is. So, okay. So what was Aditya's initial response was that we take cases so that we can understand better what is happening, right? So say I have a one and a zero, and whenever I see one and zero, I mean that they are they're odd and even. So don't please don't mistake them for like actual numbers. I mean odd and even. So if I have a one and zero, what is their difference, right? What is the difference of an odd number and an even number? It's odd, right? So the difference of an odd number and even number is odd. So Okay. So one and zero. If you take their difference, that's one. If you take one and one, that is two odd numbers. So what is the difference of two odd numbers? That is even. Uh, I don't know if I should like prove this rigorously. Just take cases like I don't know five minus three is two. So yeah. Or you could like write down two n plus one minus two n plus one is you know two into n plus n whatever. Uh, right. So I'll just check this. 
So the difference of uh, two odd numbers is even. The difference of two even numbers is clearly even, even minus even zero. And the difference of, again, an odd number and even number is one. So this is where we are. We figured out that if I have an odd number and an even number, and I take the difference of the odd and so on. Right. I'll just get rid of this. I think the one big takeaway here is noticing that we just figured out that if I have A and B, and A and B here are odd and even, like so either one or zero, then their difference behaves the exact same way. So I like this. Behaves the exact same way as a sum word. Think about it. You had 0, 0, you got 0. You had 0, 1, you got 1. You had 1, 0, you got 1. And you had 1, 1, you got 0. There is literally no difference between how the difference is behaving and how the sum is behaving. They're the exact same. Uh, right. The exact same. So instead of looking at the difference, which is kind of a, it's a whole thing and it doesn't behave very well overall. So I'll actually just use the sum. And this it's and the sum and the difference behave the exact same way only when it comes to parity. They, are, they don't behave the exact same way elsewhere. They behave the exact same way when there's a, when parity is the one thing that, that we are questioning. So, okay, now we've managed to come up with a different question. I'll just get rid of all this. I'll keep the transform. I'll keep the operations on the side. So, just to, uh, yeah. So, I'll, I've changed the question now. I start off with only ones and zeros. So, what does... In terms of 1 and 0, so in terms of odd and even, what is our initial array? It is 1, 0, 1, 0. And since our ending number is, you know, even, it's 2n, so it's 1, 0. Right? And I take a and b, and I replace them by their sum. And this is all in terms of parity. Right? Please keep that in the back of your mind, that this is all in terms of the parity. So I start off with a, b, c, d, say, and then I replace it by a plus b. And a plus b, c, d. I think this is where you'll notice that their sum is exactly the same. Because if I replace a and b by a plus b, the net sum is still the same, right? If it's, if it's a plus b plus c plus d to begin with, and it's still a plus b plus c plus d. So now you look at the sum is invariant when parity is in question. So I've actually just gone about a really roundabout way of showing that um, what they were saying is that if I look at the sum of the numbers and I look at the parity, that is invariant. I've looked, I've said, Okay, forget the sum because I won't think of the sum randomly. I look at the parity because that's what they're asking. And then I realize it, that the sum is fixed. Right. So we've just realized. Uh, okay. We've just realized that if I if my initial array is one zero one zero ending in zero, then the sum of the array is fixed. So if I look at s equals one plus zero. <laughs> and so on, up to 0, this s is invariant. Invariant what way though? In terms of parity. So this is invariant, keeping in mind that 1 plus 1 is actually 0. In this way, s is invariant. Right? And we just we just saw that and why, why that is actually something you would see immediately. You replace two numbers with their sum, so obviously the net sum is fixed. Right? So the initial sum is, let's actually find out the initial sum. 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0. We'll just ignore the 0. How many 1s do we have? Uh, some 1 quickly. Because I feel like I've been talking about for a really long time. Right, yeah. So there's an odd number of 1, right? Because n is odd. There's n 1s and n is odd. So I have an odd number of 1. And note that if I pair... So, okay. I'll just write this. 1 and there's... Ah, okay. An odd number of them. So I'll just pair up two ones together, so and so on. And clearly, since the number is odd, it won't pair up fully. There'll be the one like single one that is left out, and they're all and these all one plus ones will cancel out to zero. So my initial sum when I'm considering parities uh, is actually its s is initially one. What does that mean? That our initial sum is odd, but since by S we mean like the sum we mean the sum considering parity that is odd to begin with, and since it's invariant, it will it will be odd to end with. So even when we'll have a single number left, then the sum will be odd. But since it's a single number, the sum is just a number. So our ending number is odd, and we're done. Now you could say that yeah, so it's odd number one. Okay. 
so you could see the dint sankalp and you know other people and this rar actually came up with it originally uh just actually just get the solution why did you go about such a long way the answer to that is i didn't want anyone to feel like they are stupid <laughs> this is a kind of main thing to you know actually no my my main motive was to motivate the solution as far as possible and even if you don't see that the sum could be invariant right away at least you would look at parity and realize well the sum has to kind of be invariant it would just make real sense so that if you solve it in a contest you would find the solution out yourself without needing any prior experience in problem solving right uh, i'll just drink water if anyone has any questions please do speak up right so no questions uh that could mean that no one got anything or it could also mean that everybody got everything uh the, judging by how many people know this problem right away i'm actually going to be kind of candid about this and assume that people knew this right away. cool i'll move to a new slide and we will do now okay the only reason i elaborated so much on this single question is because i didn't want to leave you guys with like a arbitrary question in your head i just wanted like a fully motivated solution i slowly shot in the length of my solution i uh, hope that's okay with you guys right so what is 1.2 1.2 says that a circle is divided into six sectors and i put 1 0 1 0 0 0 in them in this fashion right this is my initial starting point and in a single step in a single step i take two elements and i increment them both by 1 so plus 1 plus 1 and this just looks like uh 1 2 1 0 0 0 this is what uh, like a generic step of my process looks like and i can keep doing this for whatever set of adjacent sectors i have and i can keep doing this forever but the question asks is that okay why is it what sad i don't know why it didn't why is it not going okay right so this is my process i hope uh, everyone is okay with that what it the what the question asks is that is it possible is it possible that after a certain number and by certain number i mean like a finite number of steps and by a step i mean this increment thing by so after a certain number of steps every single sector Now, for those of you who don't know what a sector is, a sector is just this uh, sort of piece of pie here. This is what we call a sector. Every single sector has the same value. So I start off uh, with this guy, and my question is: Is it possible to get to a point where it's just a a a a a or some natural number? So is this possible? This is the question. I'll zoom out. And I'll 1930. I'll I'm just saying that the parity of the sum remains constant. That is true. The parity of the sum does remain constant. But okay, I'll actually come to this. Yeah. Uh, do you guys keep? Okay, that's that's an that's actually an invariant. I'll quickly rationalize why that's true. If I have A and B in my two sectors, and I increase them both by one, then my net sum. My net sum in the, uh, the the net sum of the numbers in all six sectors increases by two. Increment by two doesn't change the parity. The parity of the sum is actually constant, so that's actually invariant. Uh, very good, Aditya. Very good. But I am not very sure that's a very useful invariant. So that's actually a new lesson that we learned. Every once in a while, you'll run into invariants that actually are invariants, but they are not very useful ones. 
they won't do you any good or their invariance is not very useful in itself. Uh, okay, I'll wait till 1933 and I'll listen to all your ideas. But yes, I would say that is definitely an invariant. Uh, and we'll get to why I think it doesn't work. It might just work. I don't know. I've never thought about this. It might just work and that would be amazing. But, um, sorry. Yeah, whatever. You guys keep, uh, you guys think. I think I have a solution. Uh, first of all, have you seen this problem? No. Okay, then please, please go on. Uh, so, so I was thinking of like taking sectors of three each, like let's say like three sectors, skipping one each day. So like opposite sector sort of. So taking the one, the one, and the zero, and then taking the zero, zero, and zero. Hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, go on. And then whenever you increment to adjoining sectors, you always increment um one. You increment both of the groups at the same time because yeah, yeah. every yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Then I think that completes it, right? Because yeah, but what is the invariant? Like you've given me a fact. What is the what is the actual function that stays? Whose value is it? Whose value is fixed? Uh, the sum of um each sector. I mean, of not each sector, each say half by. Yeah, but that is not fixed. So that increases or like that increases, in but at every step, um. Both of them increase by the same value. So say the difference is the same. Yes. So, okay. Yes. Thank you so much. That was very smart of you. Yes, that is the invariant. Even I was looking for and I'm motivated. Obviously, I'm motivated. But yes, uh, congratulations on it. You you found the you found the most I what I think is the most natural uh invariant here. And that changes from person to person. Maybe to you the parity of the sum remains constant uh, invariant is actually more natural, but I feel like that is that. The only reason I thought of that is because the last the last solution used parity uh, on an arbitrary basis. I think Gomez's solution was probably more natural. No, no, and Aditya, don't take this from the wrong. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, you can use the sec difference between the sectors. And okay, yeah, okay, that's pretty much what Gomez has done anyway. Okay, yes, so congrats, Gomez. I'll start speaking myself in a while. Does anyone else have any other ideas? Also, note that I I have like at most. Two solutions to any problem that I'll do, maybe three at most. If you guys can come up with new solutions on your own, that would be like way more than I could expect, or like that would just be amazing. So if you have any ideas, please please say it. Don't worry about them being right or wrong. Okay, does anyone else have any other ideas? Because then I'll start motivating the solution that Roman just said. Any ideas? Mm. Okay, nice. Okay, so Pavan is saying uh, alternating sums. What do you mean by, sorry, what do you mean by that, Pavan? You can open your mic or. The issue with typing is that even though you're typing, I have no idea whether you are or not. So it's probably best if you open your mic. But yeah. Okay, so the sectors are A, B, C, D, E, F. So she's saying uh, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. A plus B minus C. Plus. Yes. Yes. And if you notice, that's exactly the invariant that Romit created. That's actually just the invariant that Romit created. Like, I don't know if you noticed what he did. So you are saying that um, you are saying that you take this. So this guy is A, this is B, this is C, this is D, this is E, this is F. What Roman said is you look at A, C, E, you look at their sum, A plus C plus E, and then you look at the other sum. Yeah, the, plus B uh, plus the sum will be invariant. No, 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 I'm not saying that. Okay. Oh, wait, are you saying the net sum? So A plus B plus C plus D plus yeah. E plus F. Well, that being variant, isn't that increasing? Okay. Yeah, because you're you are increasing things, right? Okay, but so that's sums actually if you have say fifteen different numbers, please always try to check if their sum is useful. Because the uh, Olympiad experience 
kind of dictates that uh, they have useful role. Right. So what Romit said is, uh, you look at you look at uh, A, C, and E. You take their sum, and then you look at B, D, B, D, F, and you look at their sum, and you realize that when you increment any two adjacent sectors, both of these sums increment at the same time. If I look at the difference, then that number is zero, which is what you've written, Paul. So yeah, you two have come up like you cross the exact same uh, invariant, right? Okay, I'll actually get to my own solution. So I'll just uh, nicely get it. Actually, I should have kept it there because that's very useful, right? So now I'll motivate the solution by which I mean that maybe you saw this on a test. I mean now you. I want to like I want to make it as natural as possible, like, the thought process as natural as possible. So you still start off with two adjacent sectors, okay? There's A here and there's B here. So now from A comma B, it becomes A plus one comma B plus one. And now you as a contestant on a certain contest, you want to force an invariant. Why? Because look at uh, I when I started talking about invariants, I said that invariants help us dictate properties about future states of the system simply by looking at what was initially true. So it's asking me whether all the numbers are equal, right? So there's a process, there's an end state. I want a property about it. Like it's just screaming for an invariant. Maybe it's not to you, but like I can really hear it. <laughs> right. So now I'm trying to force an invariant. How do I force it? So if I have A and B, and they both go up by the same amount. If I were to force an invariant, how would I do it? I would look at the difference, right? Because if, say, A was, so, okay, I'll, what I'll do is I'll graph it. So, say, this was my K, this was A. I don't think this is very helpful, but whatever. This is B. And they both increase by the same amount. Now, if I were to think, well, how do I nullify this change? Well, how do I force this change to be nullified? What would I do? I would instead look at this. So if they both increase by the same, so if the increase in one is equal to the decrease in another, then there is no net change. Which is, I'm pretty sure what, this is what both Romit and uh, Pavan thought subconsciously or even consciously maybe. That you want to force an invariant, you have two numbers, they both increment by the same amount. How do I force an invariant? I treat the increment in one as a decrement, as its decrement, so that there's no net change. Yeah, so this is what I want. What I want is, for any two adjacent sectors, I want to look at the difference, right? So if I have, so my, so my invariant should feature. So if uh, the numbers that I was dealing with is A, B, C, D, or what? Okay, A, B, C, D, E, F. My sum should involve A plus A minus. Oh, sorry, my sorry, my invariant should involve A minus B, B minus C. Actually, plus minus, yeah, because I don't really care if it's you know, A minus B or B minus A. I need plus minus A minus B all, and I need plus minus A minus A, and so on. Plus minus, uh, I think what would be F minus A. Right, so this is where, so you, sorry, your invariant should uh, involve all these six different things. Now you start, this is where, just a little bit of cleverness is required. You're like, okay, I'll look at A minus B. So I start off with the one difference I need. And I look, okay, I also need B minus C or C minus B. I can't have B minus C because I already have a minus B. So instead I'll look, I'll try to force C minus B. And I just did. Similarly, I need a C minus B or a D minus C. I'll do this and I'll do this and so on. And this is the invariant we're looking for. We just found our invariant. Uh, so since it's an invariant, you would like to see what it is initially. Initially, it is 1 minus 0 plus 1 minus 0 plus 0 minus 0, which is 2. Our initial invariant is 2. What is the what is the value of this you know, alternating something in our uh, final state? If it's all the same values, then it's just a minus a plus a minus a plus a minus a, which is 0. So since this sum should be an invariant, it can't change. No matter what you do, this uh, thing that we created, if I call it S, then S has to retain its value. If it starts off as 2, it has to stay 2 no, no matter what transformation, like no matter how many or what steps you apply to it. Since 
to have all the numbers equal, we would need this uh, s the value of s to be zero. It's not possible. The answer to this question is no. Right. I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, any questions from the last last solution? Yeah, th yeah. The previous question was pretty clear. It's nice, right? It was a cute question, and I I hope I could motivate it well. Yes. Uh, thank you. That's like my main goal that I want to motivate every single person. <laughs> yes, sure. Yeah. It is definitely. Uh, okay, so what's one point? Okay, I'll actually move to monovariance at one uh, after one point three. Simply because if I try to do all six problems from invariance, I may just run into the situation that I don't cover monovariance at all. And that is not something I would like to happen. They're sister principles, and I don't want any of them to be left out. They both need to be covered in a talk about invariance. Right. 1.3 is one of my own personal favorites. I'll, I'll just define it. Oh, that became too large. <clears throat> One point three says that a one, a two, a n are numbers in the set minus one or one. So each of the a one, a two, a n, all of them are either minus one or one, and there's and these numbers are so like the minus one one in such a manner that the that the sum s equal a one, a two, a three, a four. Plus a two, a three, a four, a five, and so on, up to a n, a one, a two, a three, is zero. That's what. Uh, so this is the sum. This is a sum, right? So this is like a property, and this sum is zero. So my a i are such that this sum is zero. So the what the question is asking is essentially that if this is true, prove that four divides n. I'll zoom out the boundary here. And so before anything happens, I just want to say that. Uh, okay, I'll just put it this part here. I just want to say that I think I found out that uh, this is this apparently showed up in some Arihant book. And uh, I really hope it was like an Olympiad related book. Because if it was a JE related book, I don't know how pretty the solution there would have been. Because I think the solution aesthetics is not something uh, JE's, JE authors really care about. I'm just saying, maybe yeah, this is maybe my prejudice, but yeah. Okay, so first of all, I think the main source of confusion can that can be is what is this? Why did it? I started off with a one, a two, a three, but somehow I've come to a n, a one, a two, a three. Yeah, so this is what we call a cyclic sum. Why is it called a cyclic sum? Let me show that. Uh, okay. Right. Imagine you take a circle, and say I only like use. Sorry, Rohan. I only use uh, say five numbers for now. I use a one, a two, a three, a four, and a five. What this sum is doing is it's taking four numbers at a time and it's moving that sort of uh, set of four numbers cyclically ahead. So one, ahead. I'll just do it. So you start off with a one, a two, a three, a four. Then you move and so you rotate your circle by I think uh, what would be one eighty by five. Whatever you rotate it so that. Now you take a two a three a four a five instead, right? So you take a one a two a three a four, then you take a two a three a four a five, then you take a three a four a five a one, then you take a four a five a one a two, then you take a five a one a two, sorry a five a one a two a three, and now you're just back to where you started. So you look at all these numbers and you take their sum, right? And it's saying that if all of these numbers are either minus one or one, and this weird kind of sum is zero, and prove that four divides n. Now this is a kind of a contrived question at first sight, but the cyclicity involved is actually very important. The fact that it rotates fully around the circle is actually very important, because otherwise whatever should happen will not happen. So if you stop, uh, since, uh, since we have to prove four uh, divides, and so can we consider mod four? Mod so s mod four is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, that would actually be what. Yes, that's actually good. You you backtrack from what you wanted. Yes, we would okay. be working more for, but uh, and that was actually a very natural step also. For those of you who I, I assume uh, I think uh, 
there was a talk last week on lots of numbers theory but i'll quickly re- re- make sense of what mod for me working mod for means i declare that 0 4 8 all of these numbers are essentially the same uh okay that's actually kind of vague i don't want to go there i change the rules of regular natural number addition so they have 1 plus 2 as 3 okay that's fine but if i have 1 plus 4 and my sum actually exceeds you know 4 i subtract it by 4 and i keep doing this until my number is one of the four numbers 0 1 2 3 <laughs> and i say that and i say that a is congruent to b mod 4 if a and b differ by a multiple of 4 or that 4 divides the difference of a minus b this is what working module of four means right so for that matter we can write things like 8 is congruent to 4 mod 4 or 16 is congruent to 8 congruent to 4 mod 4 or that 5 is congruent to 1 mod 4 because their difference is 4 it's divisible by 1 also 9 is congruent to 1 mod 4 and things like that's what working modulo 4 means i was planning not to refer to any of this but uh this this is uh, i want my like talks to be as self contained as possible but yes this is actually very standard math stuff so okay but uh, yes that is a good point who is that but i think it was bagula 12 yeah that's a good point bagula 12 well, and in a way we will be definitely working in mod for right i've been again talking for too long i'll switch off my mic and let you guys throw some opinions and some ideas of how to solve this at me but yeah Right. So, if any of you have any ideas other than no working on work, please go ahead and share. right so does anyone have any ideas you know other than what uh, bagula just said <clears throat> okay that's okay that's okay this is a weird problem in itself uh, i'll i'll get to uh, well i guess <clears throat> like if we consider mod 4 and uh, replace ai with minus ai i guess then uh, this sum does not change yes so you actually <laughs> i'm correct this problem before huh? yeah yeah your solution is uh, yeah you oh, okay You know no, 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 no. This is this is quite new. Uh, I have not, I oh, don't okay. know this before. Very good, then. You you found a very good solution. Oh, yeah. I am sharing because I don't know how to share just a single window from my tab. What? Okay, I'll make. No, no, we would not take it. Are they saying that induction on n from n to n plus four? Okay. How exactly are we planning to do the induction? Aditya, how are you planning to do the induction from n to n plus four? So yours, I don't get it. Uh, you are going to prove that because uh, you understand this is a very n-centric thing. So you will prove that if four divides n, then four divides n plus four. So that is rather self-evident, isn't it? You know, if n is equal to four k, which means that four divides n. Backward induction. Sorry. Again, I don't really know what he said. Can you, if it's possible, can you open up your mic or and okay, I'm gonna assume that you have some issues with not opening your mic. Okay, this is bad. I'm running a long time. I'm really sorry, Aditya. I would have loved to hear your side of this, but I really, really want to cover monovariance. I will motivate the solution. Right. So first, notice that uh, this is just like a 
per antigen ratio that notice that there's actually just n numbers here so like this if this is one number this is another this n numbers like this why because your starting number is a, that that pushes forward by only one so if you have a1 then a2 and then goes on till n so there's actually just n terms here right <clears throat> so this is where i think that this is why i like this one so much is because when i first saw this my first thought was how nice it would be if everything was just like one which is why i'm pretty sure which is also what bubbler thought if every single number was one it, it would be really nice right because if everything was one i just have one plus one plus one and have n ones and the sum is n so n is just zero uh which is okay that was kind of yeah that didn't work out very well because you know one plus one plus one is yeah that just means that you have no terms at all it would be really nice if this happened right if everything was one it is sure as that okay so far as i said that let p be the public that p is a zero for each area okay zero okay okay i see why that would work okay yeah yeah maybe that's a good thing yeah i mean i think that works so this aditya i think shorya really substantiated on what you had in mind i think uh, that works yes that works yeah i'm not sure i have to look into it now right now i have like lots of worry that i may not um abhay do you yeah yeah i got that that what aditya wanted to yeah no abhay uh, do you think i could push to like 45 or like 50 Like Wait, it, as, as long as it doesn't go too much, yeah, forty-five should be okay, I think. But beyond that, okay, okay, cool, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll since since I'll switch to, um, like monovariance right after this. Uh, forty-five should be fine. Right. Okay. So yeah, we'll come back. We'll come back to the question, which is, it would be really nice if everything was one, right? Because that then that way, I just have one plus one plus one, and then n would be zero. And so, since four divides zero, that would be amazing. Clearly, we are not that lucky because it could be truly, it would be, it could be so off from everything is one. So, okay, so we want everything to be one because if everything was one, that we are done right away because then we just get get that n is zero. I could have just selected and removed, but okay. So clearly, we are not that lucky. So now we have to make our luck, or whatever. So if we have instead of like, uh, so if our tuple a one a two up to a n is not all one, there is some minus one somewhere. So there is just some minus one somewhere, and this is we don't like this minus one. This is not not good. It's really messing our entire s up. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just flip a switch and turn this minus one into one, so that everything would be one and you know life would be perfect. So what would happen if we actually did this? If we took a minus one and we turned it to be one, which is the solution that Bagula said, and I'm pretty sure this is also what he wanted. He wanted everything to be one. Okay, I mean he might not have, but yeah. So if you turn, if we take a minus one and turn it into one, what happens? Let's see what happens. Uh, right. So first of all, if say I don't know, say a i is minus one. Then I don't really need to worry about anything. So okay, let's see all the sums that AI features in here, right? So if AI is here, and this is say AI minus one, this is AI minus two, this is AI minus uh, three, and this is us. So this is the like the let's say the most clockwise, most counterclockwise sum involving AI you would get. Similarly, AI plus one, AI plus two, and so on up to AI plus uh, I think three. Right. So these are all the numbers that are affected by this. I will not look out of these eight numbers because nothing is because switching AI will not affect any of the other numbers. So I'll just look at these guys. Let's see what switching AI to minus AI works. So we're taking this min minus one and we're turning it into one. What happens? We'll first look at this first sum. Right. If it was so since AI was uh, minus one to begin with, then we flipped it to one. Say this first sum was one. Right, then it became a minus one. It was one, so this AI minus one, AI minus two, AI minus one, AI. This product was say my one to begin with, then it became minus one. If it was minus one to begin with, it became one. So we just switched the sign of it. And the same holds for every other sum, right? It holds for all these four sums, right? So now we'll just do a quick case rush. So, 
switching uh, switching AI just means that switching the sign, sorry, switching the sign of AI is equivalent to switching the sign of every single sum involving AI, right? So if this was one, it became minus one. This was minus one, it became one, and so on, right? Okay, uh, let's get rid of this. Okay, so say now these are four sums, right? Because these are like four four terms of our of s. So say they were initially one, 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 and they became minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. And our net change in s, right? There's other stuff, and these are all terms of s, right? This is some product of four ais. So one, 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 one became minus one, minus one. This was initially four, and became minus four. So our s s decreased by eight. Similarly, if it was minus one, minus one, minus one to begin with, it became plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, and our change was s plus eight. If there were two minus, if say there were three minus ones and a single one, and that would mean that would turn into, uh, you know, one, one and three minus ones. What is the change? So this was initially one, 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 minus one. The change is so this. These two cancel out. So this guy. So it's simply flipping this, uh, so simply flipping the sign of this guy changes s by plus two. This changes this corresponds to change of minus two. So there's zero change here, and this is just plus, minus two minus two. So s changes by minus four. Similarly, if it was oh God, this is getting really cluttered. Similarly, if it was one and then three minus ones, that would change into minus one, 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 one. And then it also then it becomes plus four, and if it was two ones, a two minus one, then it will become minus one one, and there is no net change, right? Because this corresponds to a plus two, this co this corresponds to a minus two, this corresponds to a minus two, this corresponds to a plus two, this corresponds to minus plus two, and there's no change. So let's look at. So we've just bashed every single case of these four sums. What we figured out is that flipping the sign of AI. Flipping a minus one to a one changes s either by nothing, so plus minus zero, or plus minus four, or plus minus eight. It only so and eight is just a multiple of four, and also is zero. So we notice that flipping the one minus one to a one, which is what we want, because every the everything being one is like the ideal scenario, and that's perfect, right? So I'll just delete this. So on flipping, I want to write it down. On flipping a minus one to a one, s changes by a multiple of four only. It doesn't change by anything but a multiple of four. Right. So what does this mean? That s is actually invariant mod four. Okay. Apparently, I just had to invoke mod four. What this means is that s final. Can only be off by from s initial by a multiple of four, right? So we change. So we have certain minus ones, and we change them all to ones. And our final thing, and our initial s can only differ by a multiple of four, right? So now comes the time for the solution. All this, say we had certain minus ones in our AI. Say certain my uh, AI is a minus one. One, one, and then so, and then there's like some minus ones. We take every single minus one and turn it into a one because that's what we want. If everything was one, then that's the ideal scenario, right? If we turn every single minus one, uh, okay, into a one, that only changes s by a multiple of four. S mod four is invariant. S mod four is invariant, right? So we start off with some value of s, and we turn it into a situation where uh, everything is one. If everything is one, then our sum is n, right? And our sum is n. It was zero to begin with, right? The zero to begin with, since that's what given. S starts off as zero, and then became n, right? And I know I just showed that this sum can only be off by a multiple of four. So n minus zero is a multiple of four. But that just means that n is a multiple of four, so four divides n, and we're done. And this is actually the solution that uh, Bagula started off. I think Bagula left. That's that. 
pretty sure I'm wasting people's time with this. <laughs> this is going on for a while now. But yes, that's what it means, is that S mod 4 is invariant, meaning that it only changes by a multiple of 4. And that means that since it started off at 0 and it ends at n, that means that n is congruent to 0 mod 4, which means that 4 divides n. Right. Uh, it's kind of sad that people are leaving because now was the time I'm going to switch to one of agents. <sighs> okay. Um, I want to take a break because my voice is hurting a little bit. Can I take a break for three minutes? I'll be back at 8.5. Where is that okay? Yeah, that's perfectly okay. Uh, thank you so much. Now, people, please bear with me. I am going to come back in just a while. Hi everyone. Uh, I think I'm facing some arbitrary issue with my tab. Not surprised, it's a horrible tab, but it's all I have. Let me just try and fix this.
Okay, what I can do, I think, in the meanwhile, is that I can open my. I can open. Okay, I can actually. Yeah. Okay. I can open up the. Right. Okay, so I think uh, we can actually move on to mono variants right on through the PDF. Okay, so yeah, so uh, I'll give you, I think, two minutes to read through this. Just read this area. And then once you're done, I'll actually do it myself. So I'll, uh, I'll explain. So I think take two and yeah, I'll make sense of this. I'll zoom in. I think my tab's working. Hopefully, but let's see. I don't really expect much from this. Really sorry, guys. This is taking a while. This is far from ideal. No, never mind. I have to do the other thing. Right, right. So, yeah. So, okay. I hope th I've actually, yeah. Good. Yeah. Right, so the I, okay. So I'm actually just check. Okay? So, the thing about mono variants is sometimes you run into invariants that are not useful. I've said this before that uh, you'll run into invariants that, even though are definitely invariant, but their invariants are of no use to us. And uh, every once in a while, you'll also run into uh, like a existence problem in the sense that till now. If you look at all the questions we've seen, they are all asking about what happens in the end. They are, I don't think they're ever questioning whether, or, or they're asking what happens in a future state. Monovariants show up in questions where you want to ask, is there even an end to this state? Like if you start off at a, at like a, um, you know, like a starting state and you apply an iterative transformation, by which we mean you apply the same transformation over and over again. And monovariance asks, and like monovariance is a tool by which we ask, does this process ever end? Most more often than not, that's the use of monovariance. It's for impossibility more than anything. Uh, right. So usually what we do is we start off with uh, like let me see if the tab is working.
My tab has given out. Okay, so I'll have to bypass it, which, okay, okay, okay. Right. This is actually getting really sad at this point. Um, I will not join the meetings right now. If you can write with your mouse or something, you can yeah, try yeah, using it. Definitely yeah. like a choice I have that I'll use Microsoft Whiteboard or something, but it's all really doesn't come on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open a laptop from Oh, I'm sorry, I'm uh, going to open a whiteboard from this meeting, so you can do that, you can open Jamboards um, from like for a particular Google Meet, and then I'm going to access that, I'm going to access that, uh, okay, I'll try one last time to join through my Jamboard, if it fails, if it fails, really nothing to do with it. I think if there's something happening in the in the chats, I am really busy going through like a technical crisis here to look at that. I'm really sorry, but if this doesn't work, I just started whiteboard here. Okay. This is just something. Okay, I think I have to. Yeah. Join and start a whiteboard. So I've started a like a new Jamboard from the meeting. Can everyone see it? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, nice. But the issue is that because my tab is so bad, there's a lag between when I write things and when you guys can see. I guess that's like the best I have. Right, so mono variants. Mono variants. So I'll just explain that monovariants uh, we use when we are asking questions about possibility or impossibility or impossibility uh, of end states. By which we ask, does this process terminate or not? More often than not, that's the question. Right? Yeah, so that's the thing. So usually how we answer this question is we say our starting state is S and there's a transformation T and this under this transformation our state becomes T of S and so on. And this is an iterative process. So uh, it becomes T square S and so on. Yeah, so this goes on. 
to answer the question whether this process goes on forever or not, we construct a function f of the state that it takes on in certain values or properties concerning the state, and then it creates a function out of it. So that's the process. And then we ask, uh, under this transformation, how does f change? How does what is f of t of s? What is f of t squared of s? And so on. We ask these questions. By mono, mono variant is a portmanteau of the words monotonic. I mean, that's what I figured. Variance. In the sense that it just means that the change is monotonic. Or that if f changes a certain way, if f of t s, now uh, f of t s, I don't know, minor. So the difference, the change in f of t s, change between f of t s minus f of s, this change, and this is getting way more mathy than it should be, but uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's kind of hard. The change between f of s and f of t s, so the change uh, in the mono variant that you've created, this function that you've created after a transformation is like it's an identical change. It keeps on happening. Like it doesn't uh, oscillate or anything. This change is equal to, in a certain way, that equality can not be like a direct numerical equality. It could be like uh, like an equality in some other sense. So the change is constant. That's what's constant. The change itself is constant. Even though this, the, maybe f is not constant, if f was constant, that f would be an invariant. Monovariant is similar in the sense that the change in f is constant. And the, again, this is very like vague stuff, and I don't want to do all this. And the monovariance is also the principle of monovariance is also what we call a heuristic principle in the sense that the only way to learn it is through is through problems. So I will go ahead and write down our first problem. There was a loud bike noise in the background. Okay, what is the first problem? This might take a while. So the question, uh, I think in the handout, there's a number is involved, <clears throat> but the numbers are irrelevant. 2.1. 2.1 says that I have M people. Okay, no, wait. I forgot to zoom. Okay. So the question is that I think it's not in too much, but okay. <clears throat> the question is that I have M people and N rooms in a mansion. Uh, okay, whatever. N rooms in a mansion. And these M people are they're distributed into these N rooms in a certain way. So if I say uh, to be sure it's probably best if I keep the numbers. There's 2,000 people. That's what the thing in the question. That's what there. There's 2,000 people. There's 115 room, right? So at any point of time, there's a certain number of people in in a room. So if if I denote the number of people in our rooms as say a, AI in the room I in the room I, let the number of people be AI. So these are the this is in a way the state of our system, right? So what is the transformation? The transformation is that in a given step, in a given move, step, whatever, step, move, process, whatever you want to call it, a person leaves a room, leaves their room, or the room they're in, and moves into a room, room with at least as many people as many people so what happens is if you look at it in terms of the state that we've just created a1 a2 a3 a15 are some natural numbers in a single process this becomes a1 a2 whatever some ai plus one some dot 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 to some aj minus okay, what are, sorry aj minus 1 if and only if like this this happens only if 
AI is greater than AI. So a person leaves a smaller room and goes into a larger room. That's what a step means, right? This is the thing. Prove that. Prove that. Eventually, or after a certain amount of steps, eventually, everyone is in the same room. In the same room. And in terms of uh, the state that we've created, this uh, 115 uh, numbers, so this couple of 115 numbers, this means that eventually we'll hit a point where this tuple becomes 2000, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And this 2000 can be anywhere. The order doesn't really matter. Uh, the 2000 can be anywhere. This, so it can be here or it can be here. It can be anywhere. But the end state is this. That in the end, this process keeps on happening. And after a finite number of steps, eventually, every number except a certain number is 0. And the number that is not 0 is 2000. Right. So this is the question. It's a little wordy, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. Um, okay, so any ideas? <clears throat> well, I don't know if it sticks with the theme, but we can. Oh, and also, I'm finally allowed to speak because I didn't see this question. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if it sticks with the theme, but we can induct on the number of rooms. So if there's only one room, obviously, then everyone will be in that room. And if there's more than one room, then we can exclude the smallest room. Hmm. And then the other and minus room rooms will figure them out. I mean, like they'll accumulate in one room by induction. Hey, no, no, then... no, no, no. How are you saying that? You can't say that, no? Because you are, what you're doing is, uh, Benny, you're assuming that you are excluding the smallest room from all your interactions, right? So you're saying that. Okay, uh... so, okay, fine. So I'll just fix that a bit. Uh, assume that, okay, if we assumed that the smallest <clears throat> room doesn't get, a, doesn't become zero at some point. Because if it if, if the smallest room did become empty, then we'd just yeah. have n minus room rooms and we'd be done. So what what what? Uh wait, can you repeat? Yeah, so wait one second. Uh, is this right? Yeah, yeah, it should be right. Yeah. Oh wait, sorry, yeah, yeah, this is actually a good point. Uh this is a uh, ambiguous. Shoy is asking that when you say a person leaves, do you mean each person or some person? Yeah. I mean that one person leaves. Just in a step, a single person leaves. Maybe in the next step, another person will leave the same smaller room and go into the same larger room. Not necessarily, but it can happen. But in a single step, a single person will leave from a small room to a larger room. Right. I'm so sorry, Sankar, if I interrupted you. Go on. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if at any point the smallest room becomes empty, right, in our process, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then you we can only do. have n minus one rooms left. Yeah, yeah. Then you so, can do. But how so you? now we're allowed to assume that the n minus one room. I mean, sorry, what am I saying? The smallest room doesn't become uh, empty at some point, right? Like, let's say it has some residual amount of people left. Yeah, so at all times, the smallest room will have at least one person left. That's yeah, it. okay. Yeah. So at some point, it stops changing, right? Because if you, I mean, you can't go from one to zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from that point, we can say these n minus one rooms figure themselves out and then everyone trickles in from the last room, I guess. Oh, that is, that is actually a very smart solution. I did not see that coming. It's actually very smart, Sankar. Yeah, yeah, that's a perfect solution. It completely works. Oh wow, <laughs> this is this is what I was looking forward to. Yes. This uh, is actually... Sorry, where was the point where we showed that there will be a room eventually with zero people? I mean, you'd no, have no, to no, show. we didn't show it. Uh, you'd what have Sankar... to. Yeah, what Sankar is saying that if the smallest room eventually does not become empty, then it must uh, like have the same number of people. On the, on the future, so it can be considered the uh, oh. considered the square of the number of the people in that in the inch room. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the sum of the squares is we can see is increase increases with each move. Okay. So uh, we assume that the a person from a room with n people walks into a room with m, which is uh, m people, and m is greater or equal to n. Yeah. <clears throat> Then the we then we observe that the squares of this uh, of the number of people in these rooms change from n square and m square to n minus one whole yeah, square yeah, and yeah. m. We're proving it into the that the, it's a mono variant. Very increasing. You said that it's okay. Sir. You don't need to that. It's okay. So what is your solution? You know? Yes. So I am saying that this s always increases and. Mm -hmm. It increases with the value two into m minus one plus m minus n plus yeah. two. 
as there are finitely many possible distributions of hmm. these uh, uh, 2000 people hmm. so we can say uh, th this must terminate at some point yeah yeah if it terminates means there's no more small rooms left and everything everyone is in the same yeah yeah that's a perfect solution and that's actually the solution that it's the most well known one uh, although sunk i'm not sure okay so i heard some kind of solution it made sense i think shorya has like a semantic issue there Sorry, I usually write about this stuff. I just, I'm just saying from experience. No, it's yeah. just that I, I probably didn't hear the solution well. I okay. Uh, confused. Yeah, yeah. So what Sankar is saying is that, uh, he wants to induct on n. So he's saying that, uh, say like he's using strong induction. So say n minus one is two. Uh, and what he's saying is, say the smallest room doesn't get empty ever. So that means that that smaller that eventually it's a con the number of if you look at the sequence. That is, uh, like, you know, no, no sequence. So eventually, the number of people in the smallest room stagnates. Like it doesn't change because like, it can only fall like a finite number. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah, this works. Yeah. So if if it doesn't become zero, then it's fixed. And then once it's fixed, we can look at the rest in minus one rooms. And since we we assume by the induction hypothesis that uh, that will work, then eventually, then everyone is in the same room out of the n minus one rooms. And then yeah, then it's a perfect. Solution. Uh, yes, I'm. I have no issues with Sankar solutions. Also, fairly natural. Like I didn't realize it, but it's actually a fairly natural. It's a good idea. What I take issue with is who was it? Iman and yeah, I think even Akshay in the chat. They're both saying sum of squares. Why though? Like why? Like can you explain to me why you thought of it? Okay, maybe that's a, maybe that's a bad question because uh, it could be just like a stroke of plain intuition. And, then like i have nothing to say to you but what was your thought process because this is all about thought process i don't want anyone to go away with just a new, new solution to a new problem i want people to be able to think so iman or akshay please explain why you thought of stuff yeah yeah, yeah. squares higher powers all that is great actually that is somewhat of a justification somewhat like to a certain extent i get that iman but like still it's like why would you ever think of taking a like a set sum of powers at all why would you look? the number of people is remaining invariant so that will yeah, not yeah. help me help yeah, that yes. yeah. so that uh, so uh, since the number of people is remaining invariant so that w does, doesn't interest us in this case yeah, yeah, yeah. so we should look for some higher powers and that well, that's why i okay. came across words Fair enough. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good enough intent, and which is in a nutshell what our intent in general is. I'll just uh, expand on this just a little bit, and by the looks of it, this is already the last problem we'll be doing. Actually, should I move on from this? Okay, so power is saying. Actually, I'll just abandon this solution. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll. Yeah, so the sum of squares solution, I think, I'll just write it down. Because if I try to do this, then there's a really sweet mono variant from that I want to cover and this is more of a like a theoretical issue like I wanted to do this because it's it's why we use mono variants in the first place it's a good example of this but uh, I want to do a different problem and there's only 15 minutes left so I'll sort of quickly go over right Pavan is asking could someone repeat the part about what happens when the smallest room stagnates right so what happens so Sankar used an induction solution so he assumed that Every configuration of n minus one people, eventually it, it like it turns into everyone in the same room, right? And now he's proving it for any configuration of n. So what he's saying is, look at the smallest room. If eventually it gets empty, we ignore it altogether and we look at the remaining n minus one. And since uh, by induction hypothesis, any set of n minus one, and no one will move into this in, into an empty room, right? Because yeah, so that that we can exclude that altogether. And uh, <clears throat> we look at the rest n minus one uh, rooms, and by induction hypothesis, eventually everyone gets into the into a single room, and after that, and we're done. Right, so everything is zero, and we have a single room with two thousand people. If if it never becomes zero, what does that mean? It stagnates, right? Because you can only have finitely many reductions. It's a it's a finite number that can only reduce so many times. So it has to become. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was it was a solution. And Sankar, actually, this solution I've not seen before. It's a very ingenious solution. Uh, so, Pavan, if if it does not become empty at some point, 
it has to stagnate because it if it ch- changes every once in a while it can only change finitely many times so say after say 1 million iterations either it has it cannot change any further or it like uh, if it doesn't become zero then it doesn't change further so we can ignore it so it doesn't change further means no one is getting into that room and no one is leaving it so it's an it's a passive room we look at the rest n minus 1 and since by induction hypothesis everyone has to trickle down into the same room and then now you have two rooms with non zero people with one room having much larger number of people than uh, you know this the room that we that has become passive and since the process doesn't need to stop eventually the the stagnant room will also become empty so yeah it works it's a great solution super nice uh, i will quickly go over the sum squared solutions uh because i, I would have loved to sort of expand on this and uh, if possible i'll probably like type out a written solution into the omc server later uh, you are welcome pavan uh <clears throat> but for now I, i really want to move on to a different question i'll quickly write out the sum squared solution actually i can motivate it quickly also a general advice when you are dealing with tuples of uh, natural numbers or real numbers say you have 10 numbers or in this case 150 numbers is to treat them as points in r to the power n so like you treat them as a, so if you have say three points you treat them in three, as points in three deep space right and uh, what is akshay is asking are you a fresher at cm i am a fresher at cm yes uh, okay so you treat them as uh, as points so you treat a1 comma a2 comma up to dot a dot, dot an as points in r, r to the power n so you treat them as points in r to the power n, which is n space the n real space anything greater than equals to 4 it's impossible for us to draw so i'll stop at 3 2 is better actually because i can actually show what happens here but it gets also kind of lame cuz things stop really quickly so right so you treat whenever you have this is like a specific problem in general this is general uh life advice for all entire problems if you have a set of n numbers and there's some transformation on them you want to it's a good uh, like practice to treat the, that set of numbers as a point in rn and see what happens to that point as you transform right so i'll actually show for uh, what happens right and so what is a defining property of rn r to the power n or like r to the power 3 is the the distance from the center right uh, we define distance as an rn that's what that's why rn is so special it's not just a loose collection of points right there's distances involved and if you were to sort of fix a point from whom we take distances we can just call it the origin like if if you choose to take some arbitrary point in uh, arbitrary point in there, like i want to look at distances from here you're fine i can just move the origin to the point you've chosen as your reference so distance from is from the origin is what we really like it's a defining feature of uh, r to the power n and since we have r, uh, i have a point in r to the power n we can actually Uh, it's a good practice to look at the sum of squares or like the root of the sum of squares but uh, whatever it doesn't really make a difference this is the distance from the origin uh, you want you either look at this or just like the, you just ignore the root and then you just say the sum of squares this is just general life advice what happens here is that say you had n and m right say you had n and m with n greater than equal to n right and say a person left to left room with left uh, this room and went into this room right so what happened is it became n plus 1 comma n minus 1 so what happens to the sum of squares which is you you looked at the sum of squares because it's general life advice while dealing with tuples of real numbers so you looked at the sum of squares so you looked at n square plus m square and you looked at n plus 1 square plus n minus 1 square It's actually easy to check that this is uh, okay. Uh, the issue is I have to work with really low space because this is a huge problem to write down. So if you compare n plus one square plus n minus one square, where n is greater than equal to m, you can check that this is actually greater than this. Why? Because you know this is n square plus two uh, n plus one. This is m square minus two m plus one. uh this so i have to show that this is positive why is this positive this is 2 into n minus m plus 2 and since n is greater than equal to m uh this guy is non negative so you have something non negative plus 2 so that's positive and since everything here is natural numbers you have a greater than 
If there are two non-empty rooms, it is clear. Yeah, yeah. If there's two more than two, non if there's two non-empty rooms, it's clear. Right. So the sum of squares keep increasing. So that's our monovariant. I'll hopefully, in time, I'll send an excerpt on uh, why we looked at it in the first place. Like why here. But I hope this general life advice is useful and it's not. So we see that S equals A1 square plus A2 square up to A115 square is a monovariant and S is increasing by a positive integer. So that increase is always greater than 2. Right? So if, if there was no bound on S, like if you couldn't show that S has any bound, that would mean that this process could go on forever. Right? It could keep increasing without a bound. But we have the nice algebraic identity that the is strictly lesser than a1 plus up to, I mean, as long as these are natural numbers. You have this identity, right? It's a very well known identity. <clears throat> no, no, it's okay. Sorry, I think that was a great proof. Like, I didn't know that proof, and it was a beautiful proof. And, uh, like, it's great that we had that discussion. Sometimes the, why don't you, like, just because we're doing a discussion on monovariants doesn't mean that our solutions need to involve them at all. That was a great solution. Like I'm really blown away by it. <clears throat> Actually, in some sense, it is a monovariant because yeah, 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 yeah. It, it is. Monovariant it is. is that we're moving, yeah, we're turning yeah, yeah. the pages of the dictionary from right to left. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, yeah, it's it, in a in a more larger zoomed out way. It is a monovariant solution, but we are not strictly defining a monovariant. Uh, the difference he has also given a complex term to that monovariant. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So that's like a, an unnecessarily large amount of jargon. So induction is good. That's a very, really good solution. Thank you, Sankar, for that again. Right. Uh, we were dealing with this. Let's just quickly wrap up with this solution so that I can at least, uh, I don't think I actually cover any other questions. I'll actually then track back to, an, uh, to a discussion on the windmill problem. Anyway. Yeah, so we have that the sum of squares is always uh, bounded above by, you know, the square of the sum. But you also know that this is an invariant, right? Since, you know, you, people are leaving rooms in the mansion and going to different rooms. They're always staying in the mansion. <laughs> so in a way that so the number of people in the mansion is fixed since there are no, no person is moving out of the mansion. So the number of people in the mansion is just the sum of A1, A2 up to A15. And what is this? This is just 2000. So our sum of squares is actually bounded above by 2000 square, which means that S cannot increase without bound. S cannot increase without bound. <clears throat> so S cannot increase without bound. What does that mean? That it must stop increasing. S must stop increasing after a while which means that there is that if s stops so the stopping of increase in the value of s directly corresponds to that you have no more moves left right since s necessarily increase uh, increases every time a person leaves the room and it has to stop irrespective of what rooms people leave and where they go into it must mean that we no matter what state you start off with your ending state must be such that s can no longer increase what does that mean? The only way S can no longer increase is if you hit a situation where no more, where there are no more non-empty rooms <clears throat> with like, so you have no more non-empty M, so you have no more non-zero M and N where M is greater than equals N. The, and since, you know, it, it can't be that uh, you have everything zero, it just means that the 2000 and everything else is zero situation because now no more things can happen. Right. So a stopping of the process directly corresponds to now I have no more moves left. The only way you have no more moves left is there if then people can no longer move at all. People can no longer move because there's only a single room left. Because if there's two non-empty rooms, people will keep moving. So if there's a single room oh. left, yeah, turn off. Uh, how did you show that S is bounded though? Oh yeah, I showed that since S is the sum of squares, it's bounded above by the square of sums. So you, I showed that a1 square plus a2 square up to a115 square is bounded above by a1 plus a2 plus a115 ka whole square. Yeah, okay. And that is a fixed, so 
that is yeah. true irrespective of what a1 a2 and 15 yeah is that okay yeah cool. so that so it means that a process must stop it, which means there's only a single non empty room uh, which means that it has to be 2000 Yeah, so I think we're done, and we've also sort of come to forty-two. So the time is eight forty-two, and uh, I, Abhi has only given me so much time. So I will talk about the windmill problem. Uh, so the only reason I'm talking about a windmill problem is because. it is a beautiful term a truly beautiful problem and it involves invariance right so this like you can't really talk about invariance you can't end a talk on invariance without referring to the windmill problem like that you could obviously but i would not think very highly of you then <laughs> right so i'll just quickly mention what the windmill problem is uh i can actually stop sharing can you know? yeah i'll just quickly mention it uh So what the windmill wind wind problem is? Okay, by the way, the windmill problem is a it's, it's almost IMO. Uh, it's like a legendary problem, which uh, I think was 2011 P5 IMO 2011 P5. Twenty and only 22 people solved it. <clears throat> I don't know how many people went, but I am assuming it's more than 150. Would that be a bad assumption? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a whole history, and I yeah, I'm really running out of time here. I'll just quickly mention that. Yeah, Pawan asks, "Is it the one from CB one more video? C blue one round video? Yes, it is. And I sincerely ask all of you who have not watched that video, please go and watch that video because it's a beautiful problem with uh, you know Grant Sanderson has uh, pres- like presented a big solution to it. And if you are, I don't know. After trying, yeah, absolutely, obviously try it before you get the solution. That's just general advice." <laughs> Please don't just go rush into the solution. Uh, rush into looking for solution. Yeah, I'll mention it quickly. I have only one minute left. So when when the problem says that if you have some finite non-empty set of points in plane, my points are coming in truly horrible. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, and you have a line passing through one of these points. That was also very horrible. To one of these points, <clears throat> we start off a process called a windmill, which is essentially that this line, taking this point as a pivot, rotates clockwise. So it starts rotating like this, and every time it hits a new point, it's going to change its pivot. So what happens essentially is that, uh, okay, I am quickly rub this off. It going to since our line started off like this. And it it rotated like this. Clearly, this is the point it will hit next. And as soon as it hits a new point, it will take it will make it uh, like make that point its own. It's uh, like its pivot, right? So this is our new pivot. And now it will again rotate clockwise, right? So again, taking this as a pivot, it will rotate clockwise. <clears throat> We can actually see that it will turn back into this guy. The new pivot will again be this. So what in this particular oh, situation? Oh, aren't your arrows anti-clockwise? Okay, <laughs> sorry for that. It's okay. It doesn't really matter. Like as long as you stick to a convention, like yeah, I'm sorry. It's a it's anti-clockwise. As long as you stick to a convention, as long as your rotations are either fully anti-clockwise or fully clockwise, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, you can just flip the whole thing about a mirror. I think maybe even then it won't work. I don't know. Whatever. It's it doesn't matter. So I'll take this new pivot and then it will make this guy its pivot again. And what's going to happen is uh. Now it's like this. Now it's rotating again like this, and then it will hit this guy. And so you see why it's called a windmill, right? It's sort of constantly rotating about new and new pivots. <clears throat> it always spins. Yeah, it spins in the same direction, always clockwise. And this process keeps going on. But the question asks is: Is there a choice of a pivot, of a starting pivot P, and a starting orientation of the line passing through it, so that? the windmill goes on infinitely long and i mean okay it'll obviously go keep going on infinitely long and it hits every single point of your initial set of points infinitely many times i will not what happens to the what happens to the earlier pivot it it's sad i think i don't know nothing happens to it it's 
yeah, nothing really happens to it. It stays the same. It, do it doesn't change its position. Uh, the line is changing its favor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still there. Oh, the set of points is it's fixed. It doesn't change. The line is the only thing that's moving. The line is changing its pivots. So it, it starts off as a different pivot and it switches its pivot. Uh, I think you mean the previous line. Like huh? from point one, the uh, this line changes its pivot to point two, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The line changes yeah. its pivot. So like the line at the previous point will just die off and comes to this point. I think that's what he means. You can view it that way, but it's kind of a discontinuous. Like you don't see a full video. You just see like sort of a... I don't know, like broken animations. I like to think that it's a, a yeah, yeah. I'm drawing this on paper. I have no animation tools. Uh, I think you can actually watch Three Blue One Runs video. The like the animation is very clear in the beginning and it doesn't spoil the animation. Right. <clears throat> so you guys, you guys know the problem. Please try it. And I don't expect like uh, like uh, some of you to solve the problem right away. Maybe you don't solve it at all, and that's okay. Like I, I think I tried this problem for like one full day with no like i touched upon some of the uh topics and uh, like some of the ideas involving the solutions that i actually don't think i got close to one but you guys really i really encourage all of you to try this problem <clears throat> and you know if you're defeated at the end please please look at the solution it's beautiful the problem is beautiful the ending solution is beautiful and obviously since uh, this is a lecture about invariance it does in fact involve invariance it's it's a hint okay if you want to take, take it as a hint it is a hint there is an invariant here and it's actually a really pretty problem because the invariant is geometric so yeah this is the problem i want to end on it's a beautiful problem and i think i have linked the video in my in the pdf i sent out uh i think you guys already have it on the omc server please take a look at it and please take a look at the video more importantly and uh yeah i think we're done <laughs> Okay, sure, I'll, I'll accept friend requests. Uh, all right, I think uh, I'm done. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, <clears throat> I'll stop recording. Uh,